Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. And Pete's Crit! Hello! Absolute time, guys. I'm Justin Burt, joined tonight by doctors Sam Mazur, Alice Shank, and Zach Hodges. Say hi, team! Hey! Hello! Full team, wide spectrum of pediatric care talked about today. Guest tonight is Dr. Nada Malik, who teaches us about rapid responses. It's great whether you're a hospitalist, a med student, an intensivist. But before we get into the amazing content, Sam, can you remind us about our show? Absolutely, Justin. We are the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring p- clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answering lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. And we are your on air critical care consultants, the Peds Crit team. Yes. And today we're talking to Dr. Nada Malik. Nada is a pediatric intensivist at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. She has a master's in biochem and molecular biology from Hopkins. After which, she did her medical residency chief resident year at VCU and her critical care fellowship, like Jerry Zimmerman and myself, at Children's <laughs> National Hospital. Nada now serves as the physician chair for both the Pediatric Early Recognition and Resuscitation Committee, as well as the Late Rescue Collaborative. You can catch me monthly at her critical care, morbidity, and mortality conferences. I am so excited that we've recruited her for the big screen. That's great. She's got our early recognition and our late rescue covered. The full, the full <laughs> timing. If you're in the middle, we'll do another episode. No, she she helped the whole time. Today we discuss respiratory distress, addressing hypotension, and other core concepts of things like where to put your hands during a rapid response. Yes, it's like JFK said in his 1961 inauguration: "Ask not what your acute care floor can do for you, but what you can do for your acute care floor." Deep cut reference. The. For listeners, we've divided this episode into two wonderful episodes and three great cases, so be sure to listen to both episodes. Dr. Nada Malik, uh, welcome to the Cribsiders Peed Crick uh, podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to talk about rapid responses with you guys. I think this is a great topic that gives a lot of people heartburn, um, and when that beeper goes off, you immediately feel that sense of, of dread. And so we're very lucky to have an expert like you kind of share with our group some some expert insights. Um, I want to start by, you know, we're a pretty informal group. I hope that's okay. You know, Sam tries to make jokes when he can. Um, do you mind, because of this informal nature that we're trying to cultivate, can we call you by your first name, Nada? Oh, please do. Definitely. Thank you, Nada. Beautiful already off to this amazing bonding start. I want to learn more about you. Our listeners want to learn more about you. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe something um, that you enjoy outside of medicine? Sure. So my name is Anna Malik. I am a pediatric intensivist at Children's National in Washington, D.C. I received my undergraduate degree from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Went on to get my master's in biochem and molecular biology from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And then went on to med school back at VCU in Richmond before pursuing pediatric residency and chief resident year in Richmond as well. And then did my ICU fellowship at Children's where I stayed on at as a PQ faculty member. There, as sort of now a mid-career faculty person, I am in charge of the hospital's Late Rescue Collaborative, which is a multidisciplinary committee that oversees all emergency activations at Children's National. This is about 800 events per year and includes obviously rapid responses, but also code blues, traumas, anything that involves resuscitation aspect, both of patients and non-patients that at our visitors to our hospital system. Nada, it certainly feels like over 800 events per year. <laughs> yeah, I, have- I know, I know. <laughs> And, you know, it, and I was a fellow there, so I know what it was like to respond to three years of those 800 events. Mm-hmm. So I feel you guys, and I feel you especially, Alice. So I'm, I am here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So after your fellowship and as you onboarded mm-hmm. as a new attending, how did you get involved in patient safety at Children's? Sure. So that's a great story, I think, of taking initiative and just 
being present in the moment to go after what you want. It really started with me going to our sort of bed assignment meeting. So every day there is a bed assignment meeting at like 11 a.m. that all our nurses really go to. And then really the sort of medical directors of each division go to. So even day-to-day -day attendings are not always involved in these meetings. But what it really is, it's an interaction between the bed management people, like the actual czars that do bed assignments, the ED that tells you how many patients are waiting, and then each charge nurse of each unit tells you how many beds they have available and how many they have currently occupied and how many are slotted for impending admissions. And that's where I really saw the complex ecosystem that is hospital admissions, right? Like, I think as medical providers, we get a very stinted view of just doing like admission after admission, but there's a whole other side to hospital management, which is looking at patient flow both in and out. And this sort of applies to when we talk about afferent and efferent limbs of rapid responses too, is that there is a way that patients have to be controlled because you can't have a lot of patients pile up on top of one another. I mean, at least ideally, that's not what you want. Sometimes you do get that in a bed crunch and that's when you escalate the cascade of safety huddles and things like that. But I started going to those meetings because I just asked because I wanted to see how it was done. From then on, people started noticing my face. And so when the opportunity arose for further leadership in quality improvement and patient safety episodes, they were like, oh, what about her? She was a fellow, so she understands the management from the ICU perspective. But now as faculty, she's interacting more with the other divisions of the hospital as well. And so I started out being a committee member in those higher visibility committees. And then when a leadership opportunity rose, I raised my hand for that as well. I was interviewed by hospital leadership and was lucky enough to get that position. I love this so much. I feel like two things from that that I, I think are such important, like professional development insights. One is just this idea of like being in the periphery of what you're interested in, showing up and opportunities will present themselves and you will have that credibility. And the other, just the concept of a bed assignment czar, I think is a, just an amazing term for those uh, incredible people. Yes. <laughs> now, patient safety is certainly a complex topic and there's so much work to be done. What recommendations would you have for pediatric residents or even critical care fellows who'd like to be, become involved in this area in their local institution? I think I would first and foremost say that patient safety is actually more quantitative than people realize. Of course, it's about looking at patient outcomes, but really there's a lot of information and metrics that are captured even throughout hospitalizations. There's actually a whole consortium of American hospital quality and safety initiatives that are cataloged on a monthly and a yearly basis, both for hospital centers and for disease etiologies. But looking at that data is really important, understanding that data. And then if you're really interested in patient safety, asking for more formal QI training, whether that's doing like Lean Sigma 6, whether that's going into health quality metric certifications, but understanding and interpreting the big slogs of data that every hospital system collects, but being able to look at it both from a granular perspective and then that 10,000 foot view to let other people know, A, what that data means and why it matters to them, right? Like in most hospitals, physicians are turning towards shift work. So you're not always going to get the same audience every time. So you need to be able to make a very precise and impactful argument for why that patient safety matters, why your CLAPSI rates need to matter, why CAUTIs matter, other than just sort of, you know, where does it fall on rankings? Like it does have patient effects and we need to be able as patient safety advocates to be able to advocate for our patients and carry that message across. Amazing. I think that's just a core part of kind of the big picture of, of medicine, too. We'd love to dive into some content. One thing just to disclose for all the listeners is that we are very grateful to have you as an advisor, as is Fletch Together Pulmonary Rehab, a medical company for which you are on the advisory board. We've now disclosed any conflict of interest yes. <laughs> that might come up. Let's, let's dive into some content. But before we move on, I have to tell you about today's sponsor. So if you want to hear, where'd you get that this holiday season? Uncommon Goods is your secret weapon. Uncommon Goods is here to make your holiday shopping stress-free by scouring the globe for the most remarkable and truly unique gifts for everyone on your list. I love food, and man, do they have some unique ways to deliver it. From cocktail-making kits and indoor s'mores fire pits to glasses with a map of your hometown printed right on them, Uncommon Goods has everything. They even have a Himalayan salt barbecue plank. Not even sure how to use it, but I'm in. 
So when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. These fine products are often made in small batches, so shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Listeners, to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash cribsiders. That's uncommongoods.com slash cribsiders for 15% off. Don't miss out on this unlimited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we are all out of the ordinary. Alice, hit, let, let's get started. Hit us. All right, Nada. I'm taking you back to your fellowship days. It's 3 a.m. on a Sunday in peak respiratory season, and the unit has two beds left. Mm-hmm. You've got one intubated patient slated to arrive from ocean. Your pager beeps. It's a rapid response on the acute care floor. While you're putting on your PPE outside the 7 East room, the charge nurse tells you it's an infant with bronchiolitis who's experiencing increased work of breathing. All right. I feel like there needs to be like, you know, some theme music here from like a movie of your choice, you know, Halloween, Frozen, <laughs> whatever, whatever fits yes. your vibe. What uh, is your walk up song? Exactly. What is your walk up song? Um, all right. So I'm going to take a step back with you, Alice, and even take you further back to my resident days when I was <laughs> first exposed to this wild cowboy West world of like rapid responses. Right. And why everyone will kind of like internally groan and it just be like this slow, you know, graveyard shuffle. But what a rapid Rapid response is for everyone listening, and this is applicable to both adult and pediatric hospital centers, is it really is an evaluation of whether a patient needs an escalation of care resources. And it can be at usually in this context, especially we're going to talk about it going from like acute care to intensive care. And that's usually what it is 90% across the board. But some other hospitals that may have lower levels than acute care, maybe even intermediary care level, like a step down unit can also use it to ask for escalation of support to their next highest level. But for the most part, the definition that I'm going to use in most of these patient vignettes is escalating or evaluating a patient for escalation of care from acute care, i.e. the normal, the acute patient floor, to the intensive care unit. So what that usually means and why everyone kind of has their own internal response to a page like that is because it takes up time. At least for me, that was the number one thing that was associated with this because it's something extra you have to do, usually off the unit. So sort of in this scenario at 3 a.m., you're down to a skeletal staff. You kind of have to go off the unit quickly meet a patient you haven't met before, don't have the context, didn't admit, and you're meeting them at a point in their hospitalization. So you don't know their trajectory, you don't know how they've changed, and you're also having to have to get that sort of patient data from another source, i.e. their primary medical team. And as most ICU doctors will tell you, we're very big on sort of data hunting and scraping ourselves. So listening to another person's story of the data, I think sometimes leads us to have some skepticism, but it shouldn't always. I mean, for most part, there is good honesty on both sides of a rapid response. So the pager goes off, I'm walking up to my theme song in my head, And what should happen or what usually tends to happen is that the ICU will arrive and someone, usually the primary medical provider, i.e. the intern, will launch into their story of the patient and sort of what's happening. I actually halt there and I actually ask if I can examine the patient first before I hear the story. That's just because a lot of times it's very easy to be swayed by what someone else thinks it's going on. So for example, they'll start off with, this is a patient with bronchiolitis and we're calling the rapid response for increased work of breathing, right? But sometimes you'll walk and it's increased work of breathing, but it's also delayed pulses. It's also tachycardia. It's, you know, it's dehydration and an infection that could also play in your mind. So I honestly, unless the patient is an extremist or the team is an extremist, I ask if it's okay to just be able to quickly examine the patient on my own. And that way then when I'm listening to the story, I can A, listen with more concentration and focus because I've already examined the patient. So I know that they're not in any type of extreme where I have to do something invasive immediately or take them off the floor immediately. Because I have had cases where I don't even need to hear the story, right? Like you and I both know this patient needs to go. <laughs> like there, there is no time or you can tell me the story as we're going downstairs or maybe we need to do 
some bag mass first, call anesthesia, and you can tell me the story in the interval. So I usually will examine the patient first and then listen as someone tells me the story. I also have now made it a point to get the story from the MDDO medical provider, the physician, but also the nurses. Like usually I'll turn around and say, I, you know, who's the bedside nurse? Is there anything you want to add? Just because one of the pearls and one of the sort of arts of a rapid response is that you're not only covering for the medical need for escalation, but also the resource and nursing need for escalation. And it's going to be really different amongst where you're practicing. So I don't want to have too many broad strokes to this conversation, but you should know as a key to being a successful ICU fellow, what can your acute care floor versus your ICU floor do in terms of patient to nursing ratio, things like suctioning, things like labs, right? All of this is going to matter into what can your acute care floor give to this patient. So those are all the things that are running in my head as I examine the patient just in like the first kind of two to three minutes. And then I hear the story. I I think this is such a great kind of viewpoint, especially from like the intensivist who's coming down. And Mm -hmm. I remember from, especially as a resident where you're often first in the room, again, some of that fear of just the uncertainty, but also knowing like the next step we can't do on the floor or we might not be right. able to do on the floor. And, and mm-hmm. so I think this concept of like looking at the triage, I remember very vividly when I was an intern and that feeling of scare. And then as, as an ICU senior coming down and a resident was saying like, ah, uh, like this guy's, you know, his DSATs, we have him on full oxygen, he's not doing mm-hmm. well. And I was like, let's start BiPAP. And they're like, we can't do BiPAP on the floor. And it was just very reassuring. Like, we're in a rapid. Like, we can ask someone to put a little hole in their throat if we need to. Like, we can do anything. We can do BiPAP. Like, we're <laughs> we're in an ICU now. And, like, yeah. sometimes even that reassurance. But to, to go back to, again, that kind of resident hospitalist perspective where it can be scary, you mentioned kind of listening to the story after you do your mm-hmm. initial assessment. Can you talk about what is helpful in that story? Because I think sometimes, again, it's such a new experience, especially for trainees. It's not, this is a two-year-old with bronchiolitis. It's, this is an 18-month-old, at 30 sits weaker, who has a history of eczema, who came in four days ago. You know, like, what's yeah. what are the highlights? What's an ideal history for you as an intensivist hearing from a resident who just got berated by an attending to have more detail in his one-liner? Mm-hmm. Oh, love that. I mean, we've been there and I have nothing but love for those interns because I was also there. And especially when you're dealing with a lot of patients with complex care, you know, it's very tempting to start with like day one of life. But I think the ideal situation for me, the ideal synopsis would be something like this patient has been admitted, starting off with this patient has been admitted for X amount of days, right? Just gives me a trajectory of like, are we dealing with, you know, if it's on the shorter end of the spectrum, are we dealing with maybe a new, a new disease process that's evolving? If we're on the longer end of the spectrum, like this patient's been here two weeks and you're like, well, is this a, is this an initial etiology that never went away? Is something new blossoming? Why has this patient been here for that long? Was there a procedure that happened? So length of stay to me, knowing length of stay to me early on is always helpful. I think a little bit of past medical history, the pertinent things to why we call this rapid is helpful. So prematurity in, in the bronchiolytics, um, you know, congenital heart disease, oncology, you know, and obviously any big red flags like that. And then the sentence of, we call this rapid response for increased worker breathing, increased resource utilization, things like that. I think another thing that's helpful so that as ICU fellows, we don't reinvent the wheel is what has the floor done so far? So, you know, we have, we call this rapid response for fever. We've given Tylenol, we've given fluids, we've given like pain meds. These things have now worked and now we are calling a rapid for, and like more recommendation. So I think though that's another part of the synopsis that sometimes la- is la- is lacking, but it's important because it's a synopsis of what brought the patient to this point. And then also a word of note, I want to say that at our, at my analysis institution, we do have 15 minutes to get to a rapid. So sometimes ideally we'll have a little bit of chance to chart check the patient. So sometimes that also helps because we'll have a little bit of a chance to read like the latest progress note, or at least like the H and P coming in. And I think that if other people have that luxury at their hospitals can be helpful. Sometimes I know you're just assigned to the RT team itself and you don't have that luxury because you're just bouncing around from activation to activation. I'll say one thing. When I was on the RT team, I would always tell the med student, like, your role is to find a computer, start chart biopsy from, from yeah. the Ooh, second nice. we get in there. 
and anything you can find. That's a great. Yeah, so that's idea. a great point. Yeah. And just one sh- very short anecdote. I remember going to a rapid response uh, as a first year fellow. We're like five or ten minutes into this thing, and then the intern shows, up, "Oh yeah, he has complex congenital heart disease." And I'm like, "Oh, that's a big deal." Oh. <laughs> Kudos yeah. to you. Yeah, trust but verify, right? Always happens. Yeah. All right. So as you enter the room, now I'm going to give you the one liner. You're looking at the patient. You're hearing my one-liner from the back. This is a rapid response for increased work of breathing. This is a six-month-old, X36-weeker bronchiolitis, day eight of illness. We have her on four liters. She's still barely satting 90. Also, having decreased PO intake, decreased urine output, and fevers. Um, Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I'd like to know. So the the things that jump out to me, obviously, are sort of longevity wise, like day eight, right? She shouldn't be getting better, not worse, especially if this is just a straightforward bronchiolitis, a unilateral disease etiology. You know, there's a question of you said now she's not she's not producing tears, she's not urinating, you know, she's been in the hospital, so we should have been able to kind of track ins and out. So what has there been a recent fall off with that? I'd want to know if they if there's been any labs checked recently, or if the patient's gotten any kind of medications that could affect anything. So just sort of have we at this point, I'm thinking we need to broaden our differential besides bronchiolitis. And have we done anything from the acute care perspective, to embrace that. And if not, then let's work together and do it, right? I mean, very often the RRT could be to, we need to get another set of eyes on this patient and let's brainstorm together, which I'm happy to do. The ICU is happy to do, but that's where your synopsis is leading me down. And then maybe, so let's, uh, you had mentioned, you know, doing the exam early on. And mm-hmm. so we'll give you some exam findings because I think, especially okay. in this case, it's yeah. pertinent. Uh, our respiratory exam shows some scattered crackles, some diminished air movement on the right-hand side. Mm-hmm. Uh, last temperature was 39.5 degrees. Cap refill is about two seconds. Um, the child's trying without tears, abdomen soft, without hepatomedaly. And then um, one of the most important things, obviously, which I remember getting dinged when I was doing these mock codes, uh, Heart rate, vital signs, heart rate of 164, SATs of 90%, respiratory rate of 70. And so when you're getting this, you know, it sound, I think the data is there for we're ready to start thinking about how can we stabilize, but maybe you can correct me. So what are kind of the next steps in your thought process? Sure. So... I would look at what are the most glaring vital signs to me, right? Tachycardia in an infant is always multifactorial. So maybe it's like in the 160s because she's crying. Maybe it's in the 160s because she's in pain for some reason. But she's also tachypnic and she's already on nasal cannula. So in my head, I'm thinking, is there associated work of breathing? So that's what I'd look at. Are there retractions? Is she tugging? Is she grunting? Um, So if all of those things are present, I'm thinking we need to maybe escalate some respiratory support. And I'm going to see if that's possible during my rapid. So in our rapid, Rapids, we have respiratory therapy come along. So it may be time to think about some high flow. That's initial stabilization part, right? If not BiPAP. But then I'm thinking, why does she need high flow or an escalation respiratory support day eight of an illness for bronchiolitis? So now I'm thinking of more diagnosis or disease hunting. Do we need a chest x-ray? Should we worry about pneumonia? You know, there's crackles. There's this new kind of persistent respiratory etiology that she hasn't gotten rid of. She's slightly febrile. She's Maybe that, that's explaining the tachycardia. And so I'm looking at getting a chest x-ray. I'm looking at getting some labs and probably a bolus too in terms of that stabilization with the lack of tears and the decreased urine output. Now, in my little bit of experience, a couple of years into fellowship now, when I attend many of these rapids, it's very obvious when you walk in the door whether this child is critically ill or not. And it's very clear whether they're coming back with us yeah. to the PICU or they're not going to stay. For those in-between cases, how much data gathering Would you recommend in general, like labs, x-rays at these rapid responses? Do you find those to be helpful? So that's a loaded question, right? Because I think there's like the ideal world and then there's a realistic world, Zach. And you you asked this question perfectly because I think a lot of hospital systems struggle with this. So in an ideal world, I think... As long as you have a set amount of time that you can do a reassessment, say one hour, I think as long as the patient is not an extremist, and like you said, by the time an ICU doctor goes up there, they kind of know whether or not the patient has an hour to wait or not. You know, you could say, let's stabilize the patient. Let's give a bolus. Let's get the x-ray. Let's get labs. Let's see if maybe like a little bit more nasal cannula just to get her over this hump of like dehydration will help. 
right? But in reality, can all that stuff happen in your acute care floor in an hour? I, and I, I think that's the struggle that we deal with sometimes. And Honestly, one of the things that we've started to put together at our institution is a list of common interventions and how long they actually take on an acute care floor versus an ICU floor. And that's a very eye-opening exercise. And I urge you guys to do it too, because you'll be shocked at what, you know, it means. And it doesn't necessarily mean, and it's not a commentary on the hospital system itself. There has to be a time differential, right? Otherwise you just have one big ICU, but there is a time differential. So I think sometimes we say we'll come back in an hour and we expect these eight things to be done, but this is a nurse that's in like a, you know, four to one assignment. Can she do all of that? So I think those are some of the things that I think of for those in between cases. I think of why are they in between, right? If they're in between because of things like labs, because of things like x-ray, you know, like procedural things, then maybe I'm a little more apt to say, let's try stabilization with the bolus with some increased oxygen and come back when you have those treatments done. So I'll check in in an hour, but know that I might need a little bit more time. But if it's in between because they're wavering on respiratory support or they have electrolyte deficiencies, then I'm more apt to err on the side of being conservative and take them up to the ICU. So I got a little bit of follow-up question for this as the, um, yeah. as the hospitalist actually, who's here on this, mm-hmm. on this podcast right now. Um, so this is, you're just talking about, this is time zero um, and time zero right. for you. Now time zero for you could technically be time, f- you know, five hours for me and I'm exactly. freaking out in my boots and you're like, oh, it's time zero, you know, let me see this. So for right. this case specifically, and I'll probably ask you this for each of the cases as we go, but mm-hmm. for this case specifically, what would you have expected the floor tune to have done for this patient already prior to you coming to see this patient as far as, you know, whatever might have been workup, might have been, you know, labs, might have been even therapies on this way? Or would you want to call at time zero when I'm just starting to think about it? You know, when, sorry, that is a double barrel question. I apologize, but we'll start with there and I'll ask some follow-ups. No, no, not at all. So I think honestly, the the answer to your question is you should call when you feel like you need help from the ICU. And for different people, that's going to be different time points, right? And as the ICU's responsibility, and I know that sometimes we don't always do this, but it's our responsibility to not have skepticism or judgment as to when you called. I think from an ICU perspective, it would be nice to have had a chest x-ray and maybe a bolt and a bolt is done before I got there because you know you have a change in exam and you know you're not having urine output and you're not producing tears and you're tachycardic. So I think those two things at minimum, I mean, labs, they can wait, but if the labs are going to show me what I think is a new infection or sepsis, I can see that on the exam. But I think those two things will help because they'll also be two things that may take up time after the RRT. So if I already have those information and, you know, if the one liner now becomes, this is a two-year-old with bronchiolitis who was admitted for bronchiolitis, but now has a right-sided pneumonia with a pleural effusion. That to me is a very different rapid. And I can make my decision much more decisively and concretely than if I'm still waiting for interventions. And all of a sudden this rapid becomes a dialogue over an extended amount of time versus a one, which is a one point decision point. And can I ask this question as a generic question? And you can tell me yes or no here, but for every child who is having a rapid response called for increased respiratory distress, should I have a chest x-ray prior to you showing up? Whoa. <laughs> Sam, you really said yeah, it. All right. You did. <clears throat> I don't think that you necessarily should. I think if the respiratory distress is now being integrated with what you think is an increase in respiratory support, then yes. I think if it's going beyond the normal stage of like bronchiolitis, like day eight, I think yes. If you hear new physical exam signs, then yes. So, I mean, to be honest with you, I think as an ICU perspective, because I see so many other things happening pulmonary wise, I would say 90% of the time, if you are calling for an escalation to ICU, I would get a chest x-ray on your behalf because I'm probably going to get one in the ICU, right? Alice and Zach, like that, that's going to be like the number one thing that I'm going to do, especially because, you know, not all, as, as we've all learned, not all things that we are asthma, not all things that are respiratory distress or like bronchiolitis. So there may be like a hidden pleural effusion or something hidden in there. I don't always think you need to give therapies like albuterol, like steroids. Those I think I have tended to side a little bit more with the established pediatric guidelines of like treating bronchiolitis with 
respiratory support rather than additional medications, except if there's comorbidities, except if there's history of prematurity, things like that. But I would say for the chest x-ray, I do tend to think like nine times out of 10, if you're worried enough to call an ICU for escalation to intensive care, I would get a chest x-ray. And these are the clinical pearls that we're hoping to hear from you. You know what I mean? Like, okay, yeah, you know, this yeah. this is absolutely exactly what we're hoping to hear. Like we yeah. are, are, you know, doctors or trainees, you know, we're trying mm-hmm. to get your expertise. And you're like, look, this is very important for these cases. And so we're going to do it. And so this yeah. is hopefully where we can help all our listeners as well to be like, all right, guys, you know, you're about to call the ICU. You already know because you listened to this podcast that uh, that you, you're you going to get that chest x-ray and you're going to be helpful when um, when the ICU team shows up. So, um, oh, perfect, so anyway, it's yeah. no problem yeah. to do that at all. Yeah. I just want to piggyback on that one point with another heuristic that I use. And I will say, trigger warning, trigger warning to the Children's National Residents, because you've heard me say this before, but this is a rapid for respiratory distress and dehydration in a bronchiolytic, potentially. We have auto-triggered rapids at our hospital, and so there will be a lot of rapids triggered for fever tachycardia. When I come to a rapid, I do not bring with me ceftriaxone. And so if you are calling a rapid for high fever tachycardia, be a steward, don't go crazy, but you need to seriously consider, is my patient septic and should I have already ordered a stat antibiotic? Because it's surprisingly common that the ones who actually trigger rapids do have bacteremia, do have a bacterial infection. I just to, to I think this idea of like a T0, T5 and this kind of preparing for when you call the uh, code is really important too. And that when we sign out as hospitalists, you know, we say, are they sick, not sick? The code didn't start. I mean, unless this person just got tachypnic, tachycardic in February this second, I think this is a great opportunity to really talk about like preparing for the code or uh, preparing for the rapid by, you know, giving Tylenol or getting blood work or getting the x-ray or, or, you know, seeing what's going on and preparing for that potential rapid. And you might say, well, how can you possibly prepare? It's like, that is kind of what sign out is. I think it's like, these are the sick kids that I need to start thinking about if febrile, if tachycardic, if tachypnic. So I think these, these are, these are really great pearls. And so for, for this child, let's say, um, we're, we're going to give you the range, Nada. So, uh, I, uh, we saw the, um, we, uh, we gave a bolus. We The chest x-ray does show right-sided pneumonia. We did start ceftriaxone, as Alice uh, suggested. We we ordered it because we knew it was going to take a minute to come up. Got the first dose in. Heart rate's 160. Temp is 38. Still nasal flaring and grunting. Sats are thir- 93% on about two liters. What are we thinking about? You know, what are the other therapies that the, the kid might need? And, and what's the ultimate disposition? And we'll give you full... You can monitor and make the kid worse or better. What 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 are we looking at for this kid? I think with the chest X-ray, I'd want to know if there, if there's an effusion or not. I mean, that's that's going to be a big sort of tiebreaker for me. If there's no effusion, I'm kind of tempted to see what happens. Let the bolus s- settle in. Let the antipyretic settle in. The antibiotics. I mean, this is someone you know on the acute care language what they call like a watcher. To me, this is like a watcher from the ICU. Like I want to see you know bump up the oxygen to like three liters, as long as it's not over your max, what what can be done, the acute care floor, see what the antibiotics and the fluids do, come back in an hour, see if any of that's taken into effect. If it hasn't, then we are looking at going up to the ICU for increased respiratory support, maybe for some positive pressure, maybe, you know, do we need an ultrasound for like a small fusion that we can't quite see. If the vitals are better than that then maybe that patient can stay on the floor. So this patient, to me, the dispo hasn't been completely tied up because they're still sort of out there in the ether, but they're not someone I'm going to forget about. Like, I'm going to put them down on my, like, piece of paper or on my board and make sure that me or my oncoming team checks checks up on them. And why does the pleural effusion change your management in this case? Because pleural fusions have a tendency to enlarge if they're not intervened on. They have a tendency to restrict preload. They can have a tendency to cause um, worsening respiratory distress. And some of those symptoms look like just bronchiolitis symptoms. So they do require a high level of monitoring. They do require a chest ultrasound sooner rather than later, sometimes maybe even a bedside ultrasound. Um, So I think the fact that a a pleural effusion to me is something that I would actively intervene on is why I would escalate the patient. That doesn't mean that they have to stay there for the duration of their pleural effusion. I mean, I could intervene on it or I could get them up there, diarrhea, follow up with the chest x-ray and then send you back or send the patient back to acute care. But 
the presence of a new pleural fusion would make me want to think a little bit more about, you know, making sure I have adequate antibiotics, making sure those antibiotics get to the patient, fluid management, diuretic management, and then sending them back. Now, I have a, a, a promise I didn't set out to ask all the loaded questions tonight, but no, a question, about a, question about a blood gas in this patient. So what I'm gathering is uh. you're trying to give this patient every way possible if they can safely remain on the floor. What do you see the role of a blood gas in this situation for either one, you know, air quotes here, proving it's safe to be on the floor or maybe the other way, there's a little bit of extra CO2, maybe they should come to the ICU. So I personally don't have a lot of faith in ABGs or arterial blood glasses or blood gases themselves in a rapid response situation, right? I mean, what I refer to as a rapid response, as I defined, was it is a fast evaluation of whether a patient needs escalation of to ICU resources or not. And an arterial blood gas, you have to get one, you have to obtain one, you have to, you know, put it through the machine to read it, the results have to come out, that takes time. And the things that you're talking about, hypoxia, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, those have clinical physical exam manifestations as well that I can see on a patient, right? I mean, if a patient is hypercarbic, they're not going to be this like crying but consolable child, they're going to be like uptunded, they're not going to be able to push me away, they're going to let me examine them too easily. Easily. You know, if they're hypoxic, you're going to see that they're, they're, they may have poor skin tone. They may be like a little bit paler. They may be working and grunting like was mentioned in the vignette. So the key parts of an ABG, and of course, I can't forget my favorite, the lactate, you know, but if there's a lactate, then obviously, you know, there's something else going on. Maybe there's a protuberant abdomen, something else going on systemically. So the three things that I would have to chase after for an arterial blood gas is not necessarily going to be my friend in a situation that's already time limited. So that's why I usually don't procure ABGs. Oh, go ahead, Sam. I just uh, actually to follow up with Zach's question there, actually it about the patient using the blood gas to stay on the floor. I do have a, curi a question about like those patients that are grunting, the patients that have increased mm -hmm. work of breathing, right? They are compensating by trying to increase their tidal volume to try to maintain that minute ventilation. Mm -hmm. And their pH is normal because they're working so they're hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then so the question to you, right? In the question to, you know, that Zach was kind of getting at is because they're compensating right now, how does that go into your decision? Or does that never go into your decision and you remove the blood gas entirely so you never even have to know that this patient could be possibly compensating at this moment? I see. So you're talking about more like kind of like the vernacular of what we say of like, is the patient tiring out? For me, for the most part, if I have vitals like the ones you described, which are concerning but not totally extreme, like the respiratory rate is not in the 90s, the heart rate's not in the 180s, then I think that patient is compensating to the point where they're stable right now, and they may need increased support, but not all the way up to a breathing tube. There are different spectrums of vital signs, where if the vital signs are really abnormal, then I know what the blood gas is going to tell me. They're, they are on the verge of failing their compensation mechanisms, and I should escalate them. Right now, this patient obviously is under resuscitated, but not quite toxic. They may worsen, which is why I'm going to keep checking on them, especially within that one hour mark, but they're not quite there to me yet where I feel like there aren't some additional methods that I can use in between. And my personal theory and a lot of the theories of my mentors have been, if you need an ABG to prove something, i.e. to prove that the patient should stay on the floor, they probably shouldn't. Like if you need a, a stat test to prove that someone doesn't need the ICU, you're kind of saying that they need the ICU, right? Because where else are stat tests going to be? And a popular vignette that we see this with, aside from respiratory distress, is actually sodium, right? There's a patient who has a history of some type of neurological condition, hormonal condition, and they always ask for us to grab an ABG to get a stat sodium. And in my mind, especially from a patient safety perspective, but also from an ICU perspective, as you guys know, if you need a stat sodium that bad, then you're worried that it's on the extreme of being too high or too low. And we should probably reevaluate that patient because what if it is too high or too low? Then that patient definitely needs to come to the ICU, right? A sodium of 119, a sodium of like 180, those need to be handled in the ICU. And so for me, any stat lab is a more of a red flag that we're worried about something else going on and should bring that patient to the ICU for monitoring. Nada, I have one final question. How does your threshold for intubating this toddler change based on their chest x-ray findings? 
it usually doesn't. I mean, unless unless the chest x-ray is so bad, that there's like a complete whiteout. But even then, if the patient is able to maintain their stats or stats, it's, but even with like an escalate, let's say we bring her or him up to the ICU, we're able to get by with high flow, be able to get by with BiPAP, I'd still give a little bit of time and get maybe a repeat film if, if I'm worried about an effusion before I would rush to intubate. My decision for intubation is really going to be on the physical exam. Like if they start to stop compensating, if they start to have blood pressure variability, or for example, heart like hypotension, something else going on from a hemodynamics perspective, then I'm more apt to intubate. But I wouldn't intubate right now from the floor. The only other caveat being, let's say this patient does end up needing a chest tube, then it may intubate procedurally. But I don't think that's quite where you're heading. Mm -hmm. I think if you're heading just for like a physical exam perspective, I think we have a little, I would give her a little bit more time. Um, it's not completely out of the woods yet, right? I mean, she's day eight, she already had an initial insult of bronchiolitis. Now she has a secondary injury with a pneumonia, an inflammatory process, plus minus a pleural effusion. So she's not out of the woods yet. But right now, I think there are still some tricks up my sleeve. I would say if she's intubated, I would feel more comfortable if she went to the ICU at that point. <laughs> yeah, I so yeah. True. yeah. Oh yeah, we rarely do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I try, and that's another thing is, what procedures is your center comfortable with doing on the floor, right? Some places may be comfortable intubating from a rap, like escalating the rapid to a code to intubating on the floor. As an ICU provider perspective, and I'm sure you guys can back me up on this, it's not my favorite procedure because because code carts are usually stocked with different peri intubation meds, sometimes peri different peri intubation tools and staff than like my ICU, my home environment is. So we try to do what's best for the patient, but try to get them to the point, hopefully before in the point of intubation to get them up to the floor to see if there's any other salvaging treatments we can do before we get to that point. And from a QI perspective, something called late rescue or late rescue metrics, or if a patient does require or does get to the point where they require an ICU level therapy, i.e. initiation of vasoactives, mechanical ventilation on an acute care floor, because they decompensated to the point where there was not even time to transfer them for that. They had to do it to that point, And that's something hospital systems also track. I love it. Well, let's get you to the end of this shift, your post call, you're back. It's Tuesday afternoon. You're at your post, post, post call shift as the PICU fellow. The unit's diarist a little bit. Now you have four beds, one pending ER admission, no scheduled ORs. Your pager goes off for a rapid response in the surgical care unit and you look at the chart. It's a 14-year-old girl with neuromuscular scoliosis and stage five chronic kidney disease who is post-op day one from a posterior spinal fusion. Her last charted blood pressure is 84 over 47 with a MAP of 59. So you get to the room, the nurse is there, the ortho resident's on her way. What are the first thing you're doing? I'm going to the patient. I'm looking, I'm recycling the blood pressure. I'm looking at the monitor. I'm examining the patient sort of perfusion. You know, the first thing before I even walk up there, and, and this is another Pearl is to know the surgery or the procedure your patient had, right? And to know the complications that you're expecting. This was a posterior spinal fusion. It's a graft that's put on to the spinal vertebrae to deal with like scoliosis to prevent the worsening of scoliosis. So it's a long surgery. It is so you you're having a patient that is, you know, going to be a little bit fluid seeking after it. So obviously you're worried about hypotension. Um, if there's a drain in place, you're wondering, was there like antibiotic coverage? Is there a nidus there for infection? You mentioned she has stage four kidney disease. What other comorbidities may she have? Is she adrenally insufficient from being on chronic medications all her life? So th these are some of the things that's kind of running through my head as I examine her. So obviously I'm looking not just for the usual physical exam, but like Plus, I'm looking at her surgical side. I'm looking at her drain side. Is her drain draining? You know, is it what kind of drain is it? Is it like functioning properly? Um, is there anything on the, the bed side like that's leaking? Sometimes you'd be surprised, you know, things can leak onto a white sheet and you might not notice it, but it's like blood, urine. If it's possible, or especially with the ortho resident there, I would turn her over and look at her back. I think that's something a lot of the times we don't tend to do, but I would definitely look at her back, make sure there's, there's not like a new rash there, there's nothing spreading there. Um, just sort of doing a good surgical, ex physical exam as well as a clinical one. All right. 
So the surgery was complicated by about 700 mLs of blood loss, which was replaced intra-op. A drain is in place. Analgesia is provided with scheduled acetaminophen and PRN morphine. The patient is experiencing decreased urine output and has not had any fevers. So th- this is, Tylenol is a great mask reader, right? Everyone is so overjoyed because the patient's not ex- having any fevers, but I'm like, whoa, they've been on like Q4 to Q6 Tylenol, so they haven't broken through. So that's not always the best marker. So I would take that sort of like one of those like red herrings, right? Like no fever doesn't mean the patient wasn't truly febrile. You were just masking the description of a temperature. Um, so I would still work this patient up for an infection. I would give them some fluids back. I would check um, a CBC. They lost blood. They've replaced it. But then, as I said, these patients are fluid seeking, so they may need more repletion. I would check coags too. It's not you, coags, I don't usually find are the biggest deficiencies in these posterior spinal fusions, but you never know when you're looking at any type of surgical case. So I would check those. The other thing I would think of is what is her baseline? Like, does she need respiratory support at baseline? Is she on? Usually, kidney patients aren't on steroids at baseline, but some of them are. So are there any medications that we haven't quite reconciled yet because of like a PO and PO status that we're missing? Is she withdrawing from something? So there's some of the other like common things that we forget when we are rushing in to resuscitate, but they can make the difference between, you know, rescue and then further resuscitation. Not I love that point. One of the anecdotes from residency that, that stitched with me so much was a case very similar to this with resistant hypotension despite fluids on an ortho patient. And I go, I'm with I'm the intern, I go with my senior. The room is very tense, the fellow's tense, the ortho's tense, the nurse is tense. And my senior just kind of like waddles into the room, um, sees the tension, waddles out, goes to the computer, and then comes back two minutes later and says, uh, this patient's on chronic steroids. They're adrenally insufficient. They didn't get gross with steroids. And then kind of waddled out of the hall. And just it was like this most amazing, like badass moment where she just came in, remained very calm, thought about the differential very succinctly. I think, you know, searched steroids in Epic and was like, there you go, guys. Um, and then left. And it's just such, it was such a cool uh, anecdote that I'll always remember. Oh, Definitely. Yeah. And sometimes it's not always even just lapse of like forget, you know, forgetting or not reconciling. Sometimes a lot of the times it's even more like the pa- like this happens to our patient population a lot with anti-epileptics, right? They're NPOs, so all of a sudden they can get, you know, like even things that we don't remember are, you know, the patient came in in the middle of the night to kind of make way for this like 4 a.m. surgery. So all of a sudden the PO Keppra, the PO Topamax, the PO Lamictal, all of that fell off, was never replaced with like an Ativan bridge, was never, you know, replaced with anything else IV. And then all of a sudden, you know, the things that the medications were supposed to do are happening again. So, you know, just even tricky things like that where you're going back and forth from PO to IV. Also realizing how are your patients placed post-surgically, right? Are they placed on a surgical service or do they then again undergo a service transfer from their surgical service to like an acute care service so there's more handoffs, there's more opportunities for information not to be passed on. So sometimes things like that, but especially with these chronic patients with complex diseases, it's always good to know have we taken care of all of their baseline needs? Nada, thanks for all these great points. When we were just going through the case, a couple other things crossed my mind. I think I'd really wanted this patient's heart rate. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, this patient's receiving lots of opioids and maybe in some scenarios they mm-hmm. would be on a PCA. So a patient who's hypotensive sure. and has a normal heart rate, maybe I'd be a bit more worried about you know, narcotic toxicity. And if there was a PCA involved, I certainly would have that interrogated with the charge nurse, make sure this patient is getting the the dose of medicine that we intend for them to get. And, uh, and then another uh, thing is I, I worry about some of these patients, spinal fusions, if they were to like lose nerve signals, then were to be any kind of damage to the spinal cord, you know, are they at risk for a spinal shock type picture? And I've never seen mm-hmm. it clinically, but it certainly seems reasonable that a patient like this, I should be worried about a distributive shock type picture that maybe won't get better with just a little bit of fluid. Yeah, I agree with you completely. And that's why it's helpful to have the surgical resident on board as you're triaging this patient, because you're going to need to see like was signal lost intraoperatively. Is that something that they're worried about? Do they need to interrogate it? The PCA point is a great one, especially as we started to use Narcan more and more for our patients. You know, are they, what are their pupils look like? Are they slower to respond? Are they coming in and out of consciousness? So I think those are also two great points is what are the vitals look like 
in unit versus just like an isolated low blood pressure and so forth. So I said I was going to ask this for uh, for each case. So um, you know, as the as the person who is saying, hey, you know, an hour, two hours, three hours before uh, before we actually called the rapid response, you know, hopefully I was doing something to try to you know make things a little bit better. So for this patient right now, we have a case of undifferentiated shock. We don't know whether this is hypovolemic from the surgery, some infection, or what Zach's mentioning is some spinal shock. But the only thing that I had that's not a presser on the floor was IV fluids. And so that's what I tried to do. So my question for you is for each of these patients who were concerned about undifferentiated shock, and we'll say they came out of procedure, how many fluid boluses do you think is, you know, the number I should give before I'm calling that rapid response? Sure. So guidelines will say 320 per kilo boluses are what you sh- can give before you have to escalate to a vasoactive. For me on the floor, there isn't a hard and concrete number. I mean, I think one at least, right? I mean, as you're seeing the hypotension, say at like 10 a.m., you're like, let's give a bolus. Let's see what happens. Let's say there's a transient response, but then you're, you become hypotensive again. I think with the second, it's worth it to call the rapid to say, hey, look, we're now on our second 20 per kilo. I can give one more, but then it is time for a vasoactive. So I would say at least two before, because then you're giving me a little bit of like buffer, right? To come up and say, no, give a third one or no, I think this patient, you know, with the heart rate, with an exam may just need vasoactives or steroids. So I would say at least two, but that's going to be like more of a subjective thing. Yeah. I definitely have gone back after, you know, for my one hour reevaluation or, yeah, you know, checked in and things were fine. And then later in the morning been like, oh my God, they're five liters positive. I'm so sorry. Yes. Bring them down for pressers. Bring them yep. down for pressers. You know, so it is unlike antibiotics, unlike Tylenol, it, it is, I'm not mad if, if we're a little bit more ginger with the fluids and the guidelines suggest. I don't know. Yeah. Right. I agree with you, Alice. I think, I mean, Technically, like there are rules and policies sometimes about cutting off after 220 per kilo or 320 per kilo. The issue with giving like threes and then there's like four and then there's five, like Alice said, then all you're doing now is you're just leading down the pathway to pulmonary edema. Um, So I would say two solid boluses. And if you're not getting a response, I think it's time to at least call the ICU. And the ICU may just come up and say, we're going to give a third. Let's see. But now at least that patient is on the ICU's radar and they know that if this third bolus doesn't work, you know, you have like at max in hours, like the slowest I would run a bolus, but usually nurses can run it as fast, you know, 999 over the pump, run it as fast. And then we're reevaluating in a much shorter time frame rather than being called in at time zero, like you said, with the first 20 per kilo. And then we're kind of, again, talking throughout the day. Yeah, I mean, one of our big things in general and things that I'm trying to get across here is your time zero and my time zero are two different time zeros. And where can we come to a nice compromise where you guys feel like, again, you're not wasting any of your time coming out of the ICU, going to a different shift, going to a different floor, leaving your unit, but also we're not doing it at the last possible moment because we're trying to, you know, we're trying to improve our patient care. And, you know, I I think when, when, and Justin mentioned this earlier, you know, when patients are crashing right in front of you, well, what were you doing for the last five to 10 hours before that happened is always (laughs) an important thing to bring up. So so this is what we're trying to balance here and whatever thoughts you have are exactly what we're looking for. So thank you. Yeah. So thank, yeah, you're welcome. So I mean, I would definitely say, yeah, two per... You should give two per kilo and then call the ICU. The ICU will reserve judgment to give the third one. But at least now in my head, you know, the one liner becomes status post two normal saline boluses or LR boluses versus this patient had a low blood pressure and just is getting a fluid bolus now. So two very different scenarios. So I I would say two is kind of like my soft cutoff. Love to know if you guys have different thoughts, Alice and Zach. And Nada, you said two per kilo. I'm almost certain you meant two 20 per kilo boluses. Oh, sorry. Two 20 per kilo. And then Sam... You're getting in a great, great point here. I think the details really matter here. So like one end of the Mm -hmm. spectrum, you have this toddler who's had a diarrheal illness for four to four to five days. You know that volume is what this patient needs. So in that case, you know, if the kid got two boluses in the ER, now they're on your service, I would empower you to give a third bolus if the history and the physical exam fits. But you know, say this patient with a spinal fusion, if actually they're in hemorrhagic shock, because they have a bleeder that's not controlled, unfortunately, volume in the form of IV fluid is not going to fix that problem. All right. Well, let's get down to the physical exam for this patient. This is our young teenage girl post-op day one from her spinal fusion. On physical exam, she's alert but not oriented, falls asleep during your questioning. Capri feels about one second, and she feels warm to the touch in her extremities. Her heart rate is 120. 
She's tachypnic with clear breath sounds. You take down her sheets, and on your abdominal exam, her abdomen is firm with tenderness to light palpation and rebound tenderness. Nada, how does this change the game for you? It makes me worried now about something intraperitoneal, like intra-abdominal catastrophe. It makes me worry that there's more of a focal organ system that I'm kind of paying attention to and that these vital signs are kind of sequelae from those. It makes me worry also, you know, with an abdominal catastrophe on the differential that time is of the essence. And now I should maybe get my surgical colleagues back to kind of reevaluate. So it shifts my thinking more from what can I do to medically resuscitate this patient is that, of course, I'm going to start doing medical interventions. But as a, as a parallel, you know, should I be reaching out to my surgeons too? Because now there's going to be some more stakeholders possibly involved. So that's how my mind kind of changes in that atmosphere. And in thinking about some type of really acute abdominal pathology, you know, maybe you're paging the surgical team, we're thinking we want to do abdominal imaging, labs, fluids, maybe antibiotics. When as a provider, whether again, you're the, the floor person or the, the intensivist making some of this realization, and you're like, these are six things I need to do. What's in your mind of how to prioritize? As an intern, I would just put them in and then see what happened. Uh, what's your way of prioritizing of when a patient needs multiple things relatively urgently? That's a great question because medicine is all about multitasking, right? So I think that in this case, the first and foremost thing I would do is actually ask for help. I would start to delegate. There are some things that will require, for example, calling the surgeons is utmost on one of the utmost things on my list, but it's going to require time. So is there someone who can help me do that? Is there an ortho resident? Is there even one of my own interns who can look at the chart and start making those pages, those calls? And, you know, as a senior, as an intensivist, I'm happy to be there for that person making the call in case they need more information. But to start that process, to start the paging, that needs to be done sort of in one, it's kind of like, if you're thinking of like arms of an octopus, kind of like that's kind of one tentacle that needs to be taken care of. Second, tentacles, you're interfacing with your nurses and you're seeing what can they get up here the fastest, whether it's more fluids, whether it's initiation of a vasoactive, whether it's antibiotics, you know, kind of time triaging what can be done the fastest. If they have a Foley in, sometimes post-op patients do and don't. I think having a bladder pressure would be great. I wouldn't necessarily introduce that if the patient didn't already have one, but that's another great metric that we can use as we start to think about uh, you know, abdominal catastrophic etiologies. And kind of to Sam's point, what's interesting now is that now it's like time one to two for you, but now it's time zero for the surgeons if they were to get involved. So they're going to ask you, what have you been doing? And being able to give them a bladder pressure if you have one is a obviously reassuring or not from a medical perspective but also vital information from a surgical perspective so patients like these it's important because as a medical team, you can also escalate to your surgical colleagues, but then you also have a professional responsibility to do some things on your end to prep the groundwork for them to have a successful outcome. So it all becomes like a great team spirit type of atmosphere. And Nada, you didn't say this, but I, I imagine you agree. Feel free to interject if you don't. Sometimes just bringing this patient immediately to the PICU where they can have a one-to-one -one nurse yeah. facilitates much, much of the workup, especially when it's unclear if they're going to go directly to the OR. Yeah, a hundred percent. And sorry if I wasn't that clear. Yeah, but I would say for DISFO for this patient, just for that resource utilization, the the higher QD workup, I would bring this patient down just because they need so many things. And like Justin said, they need them all at once, right? And that, that's what it seems like at least. So bringing them down, you can have multiple nurses working on this patient. The other point about the ICU, Zach, which which serves this patient is that they need a little bit more invasive monitoring. They may need an arterial line. They may need a CVL. They may need bladder pressures, which the floor doesn't usually do, like accurate bladder pressures. So I would agree with you that I would bring this patient down sooner rather than later just for that initial resuscitation to be done in that intensive care unit versus the acute care floor where things are just going to have to be really arranged and can be frantic. So I guess I, I have a couple questions, um, but maybe first to kind of close out this case. Well, it sounds like for this case, we, we have a good sense that this person is likely going to the ICU. So that's going to be our play. The number you have dialed has been changed. The new number is... 
Want to learn more? Stick around for part two, where we continue this conversation with Dr. Nada Malik. This has been another collaboration between the Cribsiders. It's for the kids. And the Peds Crit team. It's for the sick it's kids. It's for the sick kids. So get your show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter at our website at www.thecribsiders.com. We're committed to providing you with high-value practice-changing knowledge, and to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player, or you can email us anytime at thecribsiders at gmail.com. We, we usually respond. We're real nice. A special thanks to our wonderful producers for this episode, Dr. Sam Mazur, Dr. Alice Shanklin, Dr. Zach Hodges, and our showrunner for all episodes, Dr. Sam Mazur. Once again, what a star. What a great guy. Just, it's wonderful to have him. Uh, we also want to say thanks to our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you for joining us tonight. I've been Justin Lee Burke. I've been Zach Hodges. I've been Alice Shanklin. And this has been Chris the Chew Man Chew. I mean, I'm kidding. This is Sam Mazur. Thank you and good night. <laughs>